And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Flexing and bringing it in hot, baby. Bringing it in hot. It's good. You guys are just stuck with me again today. Big John and his old ass are having a hard time figuring out the savviness of this new thing called the internet. So <laughs> we are trying to get it all figured out on uh, on his end, and uh, hopefully it'll be ready to go by by Tuesday when we do our next show and we drop on Wednesday morning. But uh, hey, so I'm going to give you uh, some breakdowns. John and I will go back over some of the fights probably on Tuesday as well because there is uh, one of the fights that um, there was a little bit of an early stoppage by Mike Beltran. And uh, I know that Big John's going to want to get in there and talk about that a little bit and this, the breakdown of that. But look, I'm going to go over the, uh, main of the, the main card for the UFC. John and I will probably go a little bit more in depth on the prelims as we get into Tuesday. And then I will actually go back over some of the Bellator fights and uh we'll go from there dave's got a little bit of news i think for us to talk about and uh it should be quick it should be quick you know give you guys uh some content to drop or listen to that we can drop that you guys can listen to uh to keep you guys busy until tuesday when we film again we may try to cram another one in there or something like that just for you guys for fun to make up for john's internet <laughs> and so uh let's go ahead and start with the uh ufc what is this this isn't fight night 232 it's what Vegas 82. Vegas 82. Vegas 82. All right, but look, uh, I got to say, I got to be honest, man. I expected a lot different of a fight uh, from Paul Craig. I expected uh, his physical size, his ability to, you know, close the distance, get to the clinch, all of those things to be a more, a much more of a factor, and they just weren't. And so uh, it kind of threw me off a little bit. I was thinking to myself, Man, I was expecting him to close that distance a little bit better. I was expecting him to get to the body lock a little bit better. I was expecting him to be a little bit more of a physical uh, presence inside that cage. And he struggled with Brendan Allen in the in size of in, in, what I mean by that is he struggled with Brendan Allen's ability to out wrestle him, out grapple him, out position him, and uh, ground and pound him. There was a couple great exchanges in that first round, um, you know, um, in terms of like uh, leg locks and, and, and attacks. But uh, Brendan Allen was able to escape out of there. And after that, it just seemed like all that energy spent on trying to get to that leg lock position uh, by Paul Craig kind of zapped the energy. And then he was, um, it just became a little bit easier for Brendan Allen to get into positions, for him to defend positions. And this will always, I think, Dave, kind of always be a little bit of a problem for, for Paul Craig. <clears throat> and you've got to be... Not that Paul Craig is not elite, elite on the ground. I think he's fantastic. He's he is definitely one of the best uh, jujitsu guys in MMA. But what I what I see and I'm running into is when you get to that upper level of fighters, that upper echelon of fighters, it's it's so difficult to to have a one dimensional game. I mean, he's a he's got decent wrestling. It's not great wrestling, but he's got fantastic submissions. A lot of them though are from his back. And you heard his corners telling him, "We need you to get on top." We need you to get on top. He wasn't capable of getting on top. And I, and I said this a little bit on the live show yesterday. He's fallen into a little bit of that McKinsey Dern space right now. And um, uh, there's another there's another female fighter. I think her name's like Jan Daroba or something like that. She also has a little bit of that where she's really good on the ground. She will take a shot to give a shot, but her stand-up is not that great. And so she they, she runs into problems against good stand-up people uh, that can also stop takedowns and defend submissions the days of having the one more of a one-dimensional fighter uh, are not a full well-rounded fighter they're gone they're they are really gone now you'll have some good one-offs you know um but it's it's very very difficult in this sport to be a one maybe not maybe a two-dimensional fighter someone who's got good wrestling and good jiu-jitsu it's very hard to be the uh it's very hard to be just that you've got to have striking at, at, at a level and you've got to have, you know, different types of wrestling. It can't just be the double leg, the single leg. It's got to be body locks. It's got to be judo. It's got to be foot sweeps. It's got to be all together. And that's what makes MMA so difficult to train for because there's so many different little things that you have to work on to continue to keep up with the Joneses, as most people would say. You got to keep up with these guys, with these guys like John Jones, who are willing to take chances inside the gym and learn something new take chances inside the gym to to uh, create something new that, that just works for them, that is unexpected. 
You know, um, you look at guys like Anderson Silva, where they where that, that front kick to the face against Vitor Belford, Lyoto Machida then went on to use it as well. There's just things that people are using now in the kick department or when, when Habib came along and started using different types of takedowns. It wasn't always the double leg, even though he was famous for his double legs, his lifts and his slams and all of those things. It was a lot of how he controlled the glove with his armpit and was able to kind of tilt you down and then sag you down. He was able to shuck the arm by and kind of use his forearm in the thigh and sag you down that way. Uh, all of those things. You know what? Let's, let's go ahead and invite a guest on our, on our show here today. Let's invite this guest. Who is this guest right here? Everyone, you guys see this guest? Who is this guest right here that we have on the show? This right here, ladies and gentlemen, is John McCarthy. Oh, see, we lost him again. We lost him again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What's up, buddy? We're still, we're still losing you. Ah, oh, we're trying. Up. Oh, I want to put you on air. What's up, buddy? <laughs> say hi to all of our listeners. I said, say hi to all of our listeners. You can't make out what you're saying, can you? We can't, we can't make out what you're saying, bud. And it's not because of your CTE for once. <laughs> we lost it. <laughs> wait, someone's calling me. Someone's call somebody, somebody. Oh, wait. I think we found somebody. We I am back from the <laughs> land of the lost internet connections. <laughs> the man, the Thank myth, you. the legend. Big John McCarthy. <laughs> Dude, you can fire me, but you can't get rid of me. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Man, I, I I look. I don't mind doing this show by myself, and I, you and I have talked about this. You don't really I, mind it either, but I, it's, we just don't. No, like I got it. no. I like rattling the shit off of yeah. you because I, you know, it's like it's, it's easy, it's fun. It's like it's just talking by yourself is like I'm boring. Yeah, well, it's it's not like for me, it's not that. Look, I know as soon as oh. people just saw, <laughs> when people saw that it was just me, I wonder how many just logged out right away. So nah. now, like, here we are, here we are, like, 15 minutes in or 10 minutes into the show, and they're going to go back and be like, oh, shit, John was on there after what I just the told hell? him they weren't, that you weren't coming. Well, he's in the thumbnail, it, so. Oh, well, well if you don't put him in, in there, oh, you have to put him in the thumbnail. That's true. No, don't yeah, put me in the thumbnail. No, no, put him in the thumbnail, and then they're going to be like, no, Josh, he's the in intro that. says John's not joining us today because. Yeah. The, yeah, this is Monday morning, 8.01 a.m., and everybody's already looking at the thumbnail. They already clicked on it. They're already watching. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> What's happening right now is in the past. Nah. So what did you? Well, excuse me. I want to know how interesting the show was up to this point. Well, I didn't really get started. No, no it was great. <laughs> no, I, it was good until you interrupted. Yeah, it was, there you go, man. Look, really, what I talked about was Paul Craig. Paul Craig is phenomenal at what he does. He's a great jujitsu artist. His wrestling is lacking. I'm looking to compare him to like a Mackenzie Dern. Mackenzie's yeah. got better striking than Paul Craig. Paul Craig and guys, she, she's got better jiu-jitsu than Paul Craig, but both of them lack in the wrestling department. Paul Craig's probably got better wrestling than Mackenzie Dern. Yeah. But the thing is, is he spends more time off of his back, whereas Mackenzie's trying to get the fight to the ground to be on top. He, his confidence is there, but when you get to that upper level of of fighters, John, there's they're just too well rounded. And so he's hit that threshold of, I don't know if he's going to be able to go much further than where he's at right now. Well, let me ask you this question, okay? It's actually kind of two-part question. Josh, name me the person that has been successful in the sport of MMA at a championship level that has consistently just fought off their back. I can think of one. I mean, I can't even think of one. Fabrizio oh, Verdum as a heavyweight. Yeah, that's true. Kind of fought off it, but most people, he, you know, he ended up not being on his back for most of them, but in at times, I'll give it to him. Other than that, it's yeah. not a formula for becoming a champion because you can get hurt. I mean, it's so difficult sometimes to stop some of the things that occur. The other part of, of it is exactly the same tenor of this is Josh, how often do we talk about look? If you have one element, just one mm -hmm. that people have to really worry about, it's going to be a rough road. You know, the sport has passed that by. Yeah. It's not that, and, and, and I'm not saying it's past Paul Craig. I, Paul Craig is a good fighter. Mm -hmm. He's a good fighter. He just fought a better fighter in Brendan. Brendan Allen is more well rounded, more tools in the toolbox, if you want to say. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that can stand up and 
actually win a fight with his stand-up mm -hmm. where Paul's not the guy that normally is going to win the fight with a stand-up. He's going to need to get the fight somewhere to the ground so he can either use a submission or a ground and pound. It's not that he's got that type of stand-up that you go, wow, I, you got to be careful. It's, we talked about it before. Basic, not bad, but basic. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you take a look at the world of MMA today and the guys that are doing well and everything. And guys that are outstanding with their ground game have become very good at least with their stand-up to the point where they can stay in a fight even if they can't get it to the ground they can stay in that fight because if they can't they ain't gonna get the wins and and as soon as you lose you fall back and then it's trying to build yourself back up it's well, tough let me let me we'll, we'll break this down in a different way that we uh, that we normally don't. Let's take a look at Fabrice Overdoom. Fabrice Overdoom was good off of his back. Still, even towards the end of his career, good off of his back. <clears throat> Had to develop some sort of stand-up because it, you know a lot of things were just starting to... Guys were trying to figure out his ways, this and that. He kind of started letting himself go a little bit too. He wasn't as fit, whatever it was. He just didn't... He wasn't taking care of himself and he wasn't getting any younger. <clears throat> so Fabrice Overdoom... Started developing what he what he called his pretty much his stand up. Remember, he'd throw the big push kicks. He would do flying knees. He knew that you didn't want to be on the ground with him, and so then he started getting into the clinch, kind of hanging on your head, throwing big knees time to in the, the body. Muay Thai plum and knees. Yes. In the body. So he made he made adjustments for for people to be like, "Cook, he's good now with his long push kicks, his long jabs, and he's good at the Muay Thai plum, and it makes me want to take him down or at least get there and get to the body lock. Then he can kind of pull me down." start threatening the submissions in that area. He was also very good, like Damian Wild, Damian Maya was, is even if Damian did get put down on his back, Damian Maya was really good at the half guard and really good at his butterfly sweeps. He was good at getting to the top. Paul Craig lacks in both those areas. Doesn't even try most you of know, the time, though. John, there was a moment where there was a chance for them both to scramble to see who get on top. Paul Craig yeah. went to his back. He laid, know, he laid what, to his that's back. That's my point. He doesn't even really try for those reversals and sweeps because he's like, I can take care of this from my back. And and sometimes he can, but man, when you're getting into that upper level of competition, mm -hmm. everyone's got a ground game. It's very rare. I mean, if you're going to look and you're going to say, okay, are there guys out there that you know don't have a great ground game that are champions? Yes, Alex Pereira, look at him. Yeah. He doesn't have a great ground game. He doesn't need it because he can punch a hole in your fucking head yeah. you know in the stand-up and you've got to get past that stand-up and he's his defensive wrestling is getting better all the time but yeah you can be there but you got to be so good at that one element and when it's that element is where the fight starts that's going to make it easier than the other way where you've got to get it to a certain position to try to use those tools and for the most part Look, everyone out there has got a, a decent ground game where they can deal with a lot of things. Look at Brendan Allen got caught. He got caught in that calf slicer. Oh yeah. No matter what, I if you know, I haven't talked to Brendan Allen. I don't I haven't you know heard anything he said, but I know that that was not comfortable. No. Okay. I know what it feels like. You know what it feels like. I know how it affects your knee. It can affect your ankle if he's pulling a certain way. There's all kinds of things. It smashes, you know, the, the calf muscle itself, so it kind of, you know, makes it to where it doesn't work well. But it's not enough. A calf slicer usually in today's MMA at the upper levels. You'll catch people with it in a regional show. You know, Charles Oliveira caught, you know, I can't remember who the hell it was, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in a fight I did in the UFC with him. But, again, it was at that time Charles was down, you know, in the, in the unranked. You get into the rank fighters, no one's giving up on a calf slicer. It ain't happening. Yeah. They're not going to tap. They're not going to stop. And you gotta, you're going to have to go to at least to something else. Like, do you remember Tyson Griffin? Yeah. Remember him with a calf slicer, him and Frankie Edgar going, mm -hmm. going back and forth. And then both, both had knee bar, calf slicer. Yeah. It didn't, didn't stop. I mean, look, the days, and I was talking to Dave about this, um, right before you came on <clears throat> and i said if the elevate if the the level has changed to the point where top world-class wrestlers are not just doing blast doubles and getting you guys down now it's turned into one to a single leg to a double leg 
to yep. the fence, bounce you off the fence, lift and scoop the way that they step behind. Those days are gone. You need to chain wrestle to get into that, to get a takedown. There's no more of it. I mean, and everyone defends the first takedown. Now, sometimes now majority of them defend the second, second, sometimes the third. Yeah. That's and so the way you, it is. you need to be able to put it together to think that you can just have jujitsu off your back. You're going to get, you're going to be able to catch, you're going to be able to catch these fighters sometimes. But when you get to that upper level of the top five or six, I'm sorry, man, you get in that top well, five. It's just too hard. <laughs> I mean, Josh, the, you know, the sport started off of that and everyone said, oh, you know, jujitsu. And look, I was doing jujitsu at that time before everyone even kind of knew what it was. And it was like, yeah, because no one knew what we did. Mm -hmm. But as soon as people started practicing it themselves and making it part of their entire, you know, arsenal and everything, yeah. everything has changed. And, and you can get the specialist that is so good in jujitsu that they have the ability you know if you took you know you took a you know the rotolo brothers you took a, a gordon ryan and they get the fight to the ground with just about anybody they're gonna do pretty damn well yeah. down there okay but they gotta get the fight there yeah they gotta get it there and, and it's just not easy anymore because everyone has become decent with their wrestling defense <clears throat> decent with their ability to stop mm -hmm. You know, the takedowns, and it's like good wrestlers are not getting people to the ground now. Yeah, I mean, look, I can you can take the Rulatilla brothers. You can take Gordon Ryan. You can take all these fighters. <clears throat> take Crone Gracie, these yeah. guys. But it doesn't mean they're going to be great fighters. Even when even once they get you to the ground, I start landing shots in your face. You're not the same jiu-jitsu guy. No. <clears throat> and that old saying of, you know, a black belt turns to a white belt real fast, one or two strikes. It's true. Yeah. And I'll give you guys an example. I was training with Hoffa Mendez. We you know when Hoffa Mendez was like just getting the, like basically just peaked at his pines, you know, just, I think it was his first or second world championship that he had won. World, world-class level. Yeah. He's like, don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's okay. And he knew, and he just knew, he's like, he just knew that. And I'm like, and we talked a little bit afterwards, like, I don't like to be hit. He's like, I don't yeah. like that. And, and Jiu Jitsu goes out the door. His Jiu Jitsu, it doesn't, it's not the same. I don't like to be hit. And I respected, I respect the shit out of that. Yeah. Like, I came out here to help you and BJ Penn and other guys. We were all in Hawaii training with BJ for one of his fights. He's like, I came out here to help you guys train Jiu Jitsu. I didn't come out here to help you guys punch me in the face. <laughs> it's like, so, and I respect the shit out of him for that because the fact that he's like, look, I'm good in this area and I know where my, I know where I belong. This is it. Okay, that's it. Here's, I appreciate this is, that. This right here is my box. This is my world. Mm -hmm. And I'm comfortable with anybody in this box. Yeah. You start well, to take me out of that. It's you said the same. What was it? I think it was you that said it. I quoted it a little bit last night, I think. And uh, when I did the live show real quick and I was like, Hey, I go, Randy Tour was a wasn't a black belt in anything, but he was a black belt in whooping motherfuckers' asses. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and it. you have to remember, guys like Dan Henderson. I don't think he ever got a black belt, did he? No, no. no. Dan Henderson, Randy Gatour, no, no, like, no, no black belt. Randy Tour, no black, no black belt in anything. Well, I guess later on, Neil Melanson gave Randy Couture a black belt <laughs> in his form of jujitsu and stuff. But Randy mm. got a black belt in whooping ass. Yeah, because he was good. And he learned all of these other aspects of fighting that made it to where he took what he was good at and applied it, but he had to be good at something else to get mm -hmm. there. And that's the real difference is, you know, right now you are taking a look at Paul Craig. I thought he looked, you know, he looked in great shape. Yeah. He looked fantastic going in there. He's got his hair back too. That really looks good. <laughs> but, you know, the whole thing is you can tell that he's in shape. Yeah. And you can tell he's tough. I give him credit, man. You know, the guy, he'll take shots. But you can only take so many, you know, and right away, you know, Brendan Allen, when he was on top, he landed some heavy blows. Oh, yeah. Just from guard, opened him up, you know, and then, you know, you just, when they got into the scramble and you saw in that scramble, there was a moment for Paul Craig to get up, as you said in that, you know, and the, even off of the legs when they were entwining mm -hmm. the legs and both going after an ankle and it wasn't even part of his thought process and that's the problem yeah you've got to get to the top position i don't give a damn who you are it's gonna make you that much better and give you a better chance at winning this fight based upon 
your opponent, if he is going to try to hit you, most of the time, the person on the bottom is not going to get off better shots mm. than the person on top. Yeah, he's going to have to run me to that situation. You know, I've given, <clears throat> like with Michael Chandler, when he gets into exchanges, and that thought process doesn't even go through his mind to shoot. And he's fucking a good yeah. wrestler, a really good yeah, wrestler. Yeah. You go back and watch some of his past fights where he used to wrestle guys to death and just do damage for the top. It, it doesn't go through his mind at all. And you're just like, okay, well, that means that you don't either train it or you just haven't, you haven't, you decide to you make a constant choice, a conscious to- choice of not Absolutely. doing it. And yeah. with him, I, there was that moment of the scrambling to get back up to the feet and they were both equally on their backs. And he sat up, Paul Craig sat up and he was a little bit ahead of him and getting up and he just rolled to his back. And this fight, That's you it. know what it reminded me of? Do you remember the Alan Belcher and Paul Harris fight? I believe it was oh, that yeah. fight. Yeah. And Alan Bell, everyone, and I actually thought Alan Belcher was going to get submitted. And he yeah. put a fucking whooping on Paul Harris. Yeah. And he's, and, and that lets you know, world class. He actually got into world. a leg lock battle for a little. Yeah. <laughs> right? Go, what are you doing? I know. What like, are you doing? Like, what, is that, what, what is he doing? Get out, get away. And he was, yeah. no, he's like, I'm going to hang out right here. I'm just going to jack you up. And yeah. just did work. Yeah. And. And what people don't, I think, for the casual fan at home or for fans that are listening to us, um, once you chase those submissions for two, one, two rounds, and you're chasing them heavily and the guy keeps getting out, you're exhausted. That calf slicer didn't work out. The exchange, a couple other attacks right after that didn't work out. And then Brendan, I was like, Psh, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're is not as strong. You're a little slipperier now. Like, unless I fuck up and make a mistake. You're not subbing me. He felt comfortable jumping into the guard. He felt comfortable getting the takedowns and being on top. He didn't. The, the submission threat wasn't there anymore. No. And especially when you look, you start to put a little bit of sweat and a little yeah. bit of blood together. Yeah. It becomes very slippery, and it's, you know things just to apply a submission. Mm-hmm. The guy's really got to make a mistake and leave it, and you catch it right. So, not saying that Craig couldn't have done that, but you know, mm-hmm. Brendan Allen again. He's a well-rounded fighter. He's yeah. young. He's fast. He's got good power in his hands. He can wrestle. He's got jujitsu. He's what, you know, when you're looking at why he's where he's at in the mm-hmm. rankings and moving up, his, you know, his skill set shows you why. Yeah, I agree. I agree, man. I agree a lot. I thought <clears throat> he's going to have to make some tweaks. You know, he still he still strikes with his chin way up in the air. When he backs up, he That's backs up with his change. chin. Yeah. It's just not going to change. It's, it's too late now. Like, it's, it's too no, hard. It's, pro- it's-, it's programmed into him. He's going to have to take serious. For him to break that, you know, it's like I used to talk about, you know, training women compared to men. And men are a pain in the ass. And you know this because yeah. you've done it too I've many owned, times. Yeah, gyms. Yeah, they're a pain in the ass. Why? Because they all think they know how to fight. And they all have these preconceived notions of they can do this well. And you go, you're doing that completely wrong. Yeah. Stop. This is and the biggest can't. problem. This is the biggest problem. They all start off <laughs> boxing like this with their thumbs in the air. Like, thumbs up. What are you doing? Like, well, they're cool. It's. <laughs> but women don't have that. It's, it is kind of like, you know, if you download crap into a computer, you're going to have to get all that crap out of the computer before you can make that computer work for you. And he's going to have to get rid of something that is absolutely programmed in him as far mm-hmm. as where he keeps his chin because it is high it's straight up and he's tall anyways so it, it, it's something you know you know i used to talk about you know, a lot of people aren't going to remember him but pat curran Ooh. if you remember pat curran man you talk about him. a guy the you frog take, right the what was his uh, name no that's jeff oh big jeff frog. sorry okay i know pat yeah. pat is the one in yeah. bellator pat was in Bell- <clears throat> pat was a, be- a <clears throat> champion in bellator at featherweight beat patricio pitbull mm-hmm. and uh he used to, his chin used to be just locked down on his chest, you know. And, he's, and I would be like, "You want to see where to put your chin? There's the guy right there. Yeah. Watch where." Yeah, and it did not move, and it was like just a picture perfect. And it was like, mm-hmm. "Okay, you want to see what to do? Here you go, boom!" You know, you put Pat Kern in there, and there's those guys that are like that. Yeah. But there's there are people, and Mackenzie being one of them, her chin's up high, and that's why she gets hit, and it's gonna have a lot more effect with your chin out there Mm -hmm. than it is if it's tucked in and tight so it's funny i I heard this quote it's not verbatim because i don't remember it 100 percent. but we spend our first part of our lives 
downloading data and learning as much as we can. We spend the second half unlearning all the shit that was wrong. <laughs> Basically, was, that was kind of the paraphrasing there, but you yeah. spend the next half of your life fucking unlearning the shit that you learned that was wrong. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's sad because, you know, we, we've watched a lot of those Bruce Lee movies where his thumbs are like this. <laughs> Wow. You know, yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> and I remember showing up to, you know, the first jujitsu slash Muay Thai place that I trained at and thinking that I had to bounce around like an idiot. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you don't, like I was just in the bag, you're like, whoops, whoops, off the bag. You're like, all right, now, now that you get, as you get better, you get more informed that this is not how you really fight. There you go. So anyways, uh, but overall, <clears throat> he's going to have to make some adjustments, Paul Craig. But I, like, we spent a lot of time talking about Paul Craig, but Brennan Allen, he just looked good. Oh, yeah. He looked phenomenal. Yeah. You know, um, he, he understood how good he what himself was on the ground. Great submission, by the way. Um, he understood that he was the better fighter on the feet, but he also understood that after the fight got sweaty and after I landed a couple hard shots, I'm good enough on the ground to stop your your attacks from your back. Yep, That's exactly. and a lot of a lot of top level fighters, we've trained with all the best guys in the world off of their back. It's the one they get on top that we're more concerned with. Hello. Like, <clears throat> like I've trained with world, world class. I mean, from uh, Leo Vieira to Buchecha to Lucas Leitch to BJ Penn to Hoffa Mendez, all those guys. As soon as you start throwing punches at them, their jiu-jitsu is still great. But it's not yeah. as aggressive. But it's as, not offensive. It's not as offensive as, you know, so then yeah. that's exactly where he's like, look, if I'm going to be your alarm to be on top, psh, I got this, man. Once the sweat started happening, the blood started happening, and he realized that your attacks aren't as fast as they were in the first two and a half, three minutes of the first round, I'm good. We're comfortable there. It's the ones we got to worry about when they decide to sweep us and get on top. Damian Maia was a fucking mother to get, oh, yeah. to get off you. But see, hang on the half guard. never tried to be on his back. Now, he no. would, when I say that, he did try to be on his back when he could not get someone down with a wrestling mm -hmm. takedown. He would actually slide into half guard and mm -hmm. pull you down to get you there to then sweep you over and gain the top position. Yeah. Damien <clears throat> never tried to just stay on his back. That yeah. was never part of his game. And if you want to, if we're going to use Verdum as, as an example, but I want everyone to remember, and I've said this repeatedly about heavyweights and wrestling and jiu-jitsu, they just don't fucking train it. That's the no. problem. Like it's, it's, it's rare to have somebody like a DC or a Cain Velasquez at that level with the confidence in their striking and the ability to keep wrestling and wrestling with the gas tank that they had. You know, uh, Cain was an anomaly with his gas tank. Um, you know, you've got, <clears throat> you've got DC, just world class wrestler that looked like Kung Fu Panda that could can wrestle, you know, <laughs> but then he adapted and he learned how to use his striking to make himself better. This is when he became a dual threat. You know, he, be, he had but more he, than but one weapon. You know, let's be honest. When DC started to get a little bit older mm -hmm. and a little bit slower, he started having problems taking people down. Yeah, and and that I'm not saying that in any way as disrespect to DC. I'm just saying that as good as he was, even he started to have some problems in getting people to ground based upon <clears throat> Father so time. much that he he lost that much. It was people gained that much ability in their defensive abilities. Yeah, yeah, that and Father Time. I yeah, just look father, at Father Time. Yeah, his his ability to close, to close yeah, that close distance and right. chain wrestle together because the kids, you know, the, the younger generation was getting faster yeah. and stronger and, you know, and more knowledgeable on how to defend takedowns. So uh, Verdum had to make that adjustment. He couldn't just like try to just flop to his back and hope and butt scoot around the cage. He had to find ways to get you to try to take him down or to fall on top of him. And then he could sweep you and Kimura you and triangle you and do whatever it is he wanted to do from there. So. Yeah. All right, next fight. <clears throat> next fight would be Michael Morales against Jake Matthews. Both guys, you know, Michael Morales, what now? Is he 15 and 0 now or 16 mm, and 0? 16, I think, I think now. 16 and 0. You know, the kid's just an athlete. The kid is fast. He's strong. He's He's got balance. You watch him when he's fighting. He's 23 years of age and he is super talented. It's one of those ones you're waiting for that. Fight. And I kind of thought that maybe Jake might have the ability to slow down some of his stand up and his, mm -hmm. his flying knee attacks and things like that. And to a point, he kind of conserved him. He, you know, he, he, he shaved those things off a little bit. 
but he still put on a really good performance against a guy that I know is a good fighter in Jake Matthews. Mm -hmm. I think Morales, what he did was he waited for the fight to develop in front of him. He was patient. He was patient with Matthews at 23 years old, which is very impressive, by the way. He was confident in his power. He's confident in his striking, his takedown defense, all of those things. Uh, He did get clipped. He understood what Jake Matthews offered after that in terms of power and speed. Jake was having a hard time just getting in within that range to land the cleanest, harder shots. Yeah. And then you could tell that when he did overextend and Morales made him pay, he had a hard, he, he didn't have a hard time with the power, but he saw the power was there. He felt it. He felt it. Yeah. So then he, he just, it's a, it's a weird situation where you feel like if I chase after him too much, I can get caught, but I've got to put more pressure because I got to get in there and close that distance. He was in this, it was in this really weird funk where I don't want to do too much. Get myself out of position. This kid's fast and he hits hard and he's long yeah, and he's long. Exactly. So, I mean, I'll look at this and um, Jake shouldn't be upset with himself. You know, there's not, there's, he could have done maybe a little bit more. I would like to see him maybe a little bit more with the kicks, a little bit more with, you know, maybe making a little bit more of a grimier fight, you know, punch right into the double legs, single legs, come back up, elbow knee, come back down on the legs. You've got to make those adjustments. And I use this fight. It's one of my fights that I use as an example. I clearly lost rounds one and two against Tony Ferguson. And if you guys go back and watch round three, I was like, fuck it. An L is an L, man. Go for it. Like, you have nothing else to lose. I mean, I was so tired. I was already so banged up. But you got nothing to lose. But it was a close round. You know, you're going to end up losing that round or you're going to, you know, it's like, it's, but it was one of those things like shooting double legs, shoot, like, you know, trying to get to the body lock, trying to get to the, t- you know, the sweep, all of these things. You're just going for it. Your mind is already on. You've got to make yourself so tired in training that in a fight that you, it's just mental. Um, it, it just, it just, what is it called when your, your brain, your brain just does it. So it's just not doing it right now. Pilot. My brain's not doing it right now. <laughs> it's all pilot. <laughs> All pilot. Yeah, you're, you're when your brain's on autopilot. On, yeah, that's what train. That's what training does. It's yeah, it puts you into you instead of being someone who's out there actually just thinking all the time. You're reacting. You're automatically reacting based off of your training and stuff. And it's yep. you know this that fight right there between Morales, Morales is at a 79 inch reach. Oh. That's big for a welterweight. We were talking about and we will. Jason Jackson's got basically the same reach. And you look, you don't see that. That's kind of like what, yeah. you know, when you're when the light heavyweights were fighting John Jones, and their their reach is seventy six or seventy seven, and his is eighty four. They're like, what the hell, man? You know, and he's yeah. doing the Big Brother. Well, that's kind of what Morales is capable of doing, based upon just his structure. You know, he, and he's fast, and he's only going to be getting faster because he's going to be getting better. You know, he's very strong. You can see that he's got, you know, physical strength. Mm-hmm. And he's tough. He takes shots and he does not back down. So this kid's going to be something. Yeah, he's going to be good. Um, He looks physically pretty big for the weight, though. So I'm wondering, he though, does. if he's going to have to be, if he's going to have to go up to 85 as he, he might. matures. He puts might. more muscle on as he gets older. He's, he's got a lot of muscle, he's, you know, especially yeah. in the upper body. But his legs yeah. are big, too. And you look and go, yeah. ah, it's going to be tough. Next fight. Ah, Chase Hooper going against Jordan Levitt. You know, we we talk all the time about Chase looking, you know, young and stuff. He, he is developing. You can see it. Mm-hmm. But this was the perfect fight for him as far as a guy that would definitely grapple with him, not try to just make it a stand-up fight. And uh, I thought Chase Hooper was able to show, you know, the, how good his ground game is, and it is. He's got an exceptional ground game. Mm-hmm. You talk about trying to sweep people over and everything. Jordan Levitt caught him in a Uma Plata, got him over, and he just moved right out of it and stuff and, you know, did what he was supposed to do. And when he caught the the choke, you know, it was beautifully done. You know, took his time, just, you know, sat there, little tiny movements, made it tight, over. You know, on the ground, the guy the guy can really flow. Yeah, his body style is going to pose problems for people. I mean, that yeah. he's, he's tall, long. He's the definition of tall, long, and lanky. Yeah, you know, he does um, not have the stand-up game of a tall. No, he does not. Tall guy that you know is gonna. No, it, it, that's he needs to just concentrate. I'm not saying stay away from the grappling room. Obviously, you got to continue on with that, but he's got to put more, his emphasis on his striking. I agree. I mean, he had talked about it, saying that he had spent a lot of time 
working on it. Sure he is. thought that Jordan Lovett was going to try to keep it standing a little bit. And he's like, nope. As soon as we went to the grind, he's like, all right, cool. I don't have to waste my energy trying to get the tape. Yeah, there down. you go. <laughs> you know, so, um, but it, it was, it was a couple of good exchanges and they had some good goes back and forth, a couple of little good scrambles in that two and a half minutes or three minutes of, of, of the fight. But, um, it's you can see in his facial features you can see in his shoulders you can see kind of in his chest that he's filling out yeah he's, he's starting to mature yeah it's just that he he's, look at let's just be honest everyone matures at a different you know rate and time yeah. in their life and it's finally starting to occur it's still you know fighting at the level that you know he's fighting at he's at a disadvantage until he gets to that point <laughs> John, and now John. and now he's not a featherweight he's a lightweight yeah but john he's he straight up at the end he's like yeah i have a baby on the way i'm like motherfucker you are a baby i was like what are you talking <laughs> about you have well, a baby on the way well hold it i think chase hooper is he 24 now because you know morales is nah, 20, he's 24 three is he 24 yeah, he's 24 i think is what i saw yep yeah so he's 24 years i mean <laughs> like, dude young Young. What? 24 with a baby on the way yeah, and then the next guy we're going to talk about he's young too yeah yeah, yeah next fight uh, yeah peyton talbot coming off of the dana white contender series he's the he was the hot you know subject and everyone was talking about you know how he was going to do in his debut and nick Aguirre, tough guy good grappler boy i'll tell you what nick Aguirre had a good first round but it showed i got i got to give uh peyton talbot a lot of credit he showed a lot of composure he's all right got himself up yeah. off of the ground afterwards and said all right got to change that round up came back out in the next round and just really you know he he was putting a, a whooping on nick for a lot of that round yeah and then right away just stepped on the gas and put him away early in the third and it was that was a really impressive performance for a guy walking in there and I'm, i i do think that the apex if you're going to fight your first fight, it's a great place to do it. Yeah. Because, you know, the crowd is really not much of an effect. Yes, you're in the UFC, but it's kind of UFC light. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have the same amount of pressure as being in one of the bigger shows. And, you know, that's that was a very nice win. Yeah, I thought, uh, you know, after the first round, he struggled a little bit on the takedown defense, trying to get back up to his feet. and uh, But then he just kind of came into his own in the second round. And uh, into the beginning of that third round, he just he looked calm and co and composed, and he understood what he had to do. Um, you know, the, he's he's great with the kicks, kept the yep. distance real well. He can wrestle. You know, yep. uh, he looks physically strong. I mean, I think he's got a long ways to go. I'm not gonna I'm not well, gonna take course. any digs at him. He he's uh, renew into the into the organization. But I thought honestly, for he fought very smart for what was in front of him. He understood that he had to stay out of the clinch, stay out of there out of the the grappling scenarios uh, i thought there was one moment in the begin the second round where it looked like he was gonna like he was trying to take the back i'm like what are you doing just get away like you're better on the feet but no he he fought out of he fought throughout that position and uh you know he did a good job man i was very impressed with what he what he did i'm looking forward to seeing him more on the feet um and um what he can do against good stand-up fighters because he yeah. he looked good on the feet. He looked clean. No, he is good on the feet. Look, he he's got a well rounded game. I think I think out of all of his fights, both amateur and pro, mm -hmm. I think he's only got one decision. Everything else been oh, a wow. finish. So oh. look, he he's talented. It's just that yeah, you've got to go and again, there's levels to it. You know, am I wrong about that? One decision. One decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's nice. what I thought. And uh, look, he's really someone how, what's his age i'm sorry when you uh pull that up 25 25 okay so you know he's got a he's got a lot of talent it's just a matter of just take your time don't be in a rush and just keep on fighting you know when, when you're healthy fight as much as you can and just get the experience and that experience yeah. in the end is going to pay off for him but he's he's talented yeah i mean <laughs> there ain't nothing else to do in reno but train so you might want, ah. yes, better be getting you better every day. Legacy. Uh, uh next fight. Amanda Hebas against Luana Pinheiro. I'll tell you what, this was a, it was a good fight. <laughs> it was a good fight. A good fight. And I'll tell you, Pinheiro really showed me a lot. She was lighting Amanda Hebas up. But uh, Hebas, tell me, did you not feel that Hebas was very square? you know in a lot of her stand-up her attacks she ends up square mm. which leaves her open 
to getting hit by you know a lot of things yeah. that probably shouldn't be hitting her. Yeah, she's tough, you know, and we've seen her fight you know before, man. But she was getting in that first round, she got lumped yeah, up. Yeah, she did get lumped up. I mean, you could see everything. Bill, I was like, oh man, you you have got to change up what is occurring here. If yeah, I have, she, if I had any knocks, off. if I had any knocks on Hebus, is that she does the same feint too many times? Oh, totally. And the feint, all is, the time. It's, it's a dance and a rhythm to her. Yep, which it's a rhythm. It like she, but she squares up as she does it. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. She's okay, square. Yeah, she's in her normal stance, and then she faints and like <laughs> almost like faking, fainting the, yeah. the the back foot kick, back foot push, push kick, or the or the straight right, whatever it is. Yeah, she's constantly doing it. It's a rhythm and dance to her. It's 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 something that people can catch on to. But I don't know. She's used to reacting off that. But she took some big shots in that first round. Came back Ooh. in the second, made the adjustment, and uh, and then you could just tell that uh, Pinheiro was just she was struggling with the cardio she after she, after the 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 um after the uh wrestling and the the clinch work and all that stuff in the set in the end in the beginning of the third she had nothing nothing else she was shot no. circling like, trying to stay away like, like get, everything else man yeah. once you're exhausted oh it's downhill man. yeah and, and it it went downhill fast because she look she had won all of that fight basically you know the first two rounds mm -hmm. were hers yeah and then as that third round was getting towards the midpoint, you could see, oh, she's in trouble. She's oh, tired. Yeah. She's exhausted. That's spinning back Heba into the saw face. It, and the best part is Heba stepped on the gas and made it even worse. And that's yep. what you're supposed to do. But uh, I don't know if other gyms, and I'm sure they do, but at AKA, we had this thing, and some fighters just weren't capable of doing it, like one of my good buddies, Trevor Prangley, is when you look tired, <laughs> you can't show people you're tired. Trevor, he, Trevor looked tired even when he wasn't. Yeah, I mean, like, you just can't show him you're tired. And, yeah. you know, and so when you could see in Pinero, Pinero that she was tired, it was, he was just stepped on the gas and didn't even have a lot of output. It was just pushing, putting the pressure forward. Yep. And it just, it makes a huge difference in the confidence of the person who says, um, oh, you're tired. Now I can go ahead and go farther. I can go harder. I can go a little bit faster. Yeah. I can... Yeah, it was it was downhill from there. That that spinning back kick she had thrown two or three times before that to the body, and then she came yeah. up top to the head after Pinheiro got tired. So good stuff. John, next fight. Oh, uh, we had I can't even say his first name. I'm mm -hmm. not even trying. Or or Olabi. Or mm -hmm. against Medic and mm -hmm. uh Oralabi coming out of uh Araya Faber's alpha male mm -hmm. was a last second replacement came in and dad he put on a fight yeah he, he can was, he, he's good he's good on the ground he was tough yeah he was all over medic in that fight medic could not stop his grappling could not stop the takedown could not get up from him he took a lot of i give it i yeah. give a medic credit man he was tough because he took a lot of damage in that fight but that's you know the neck crank was that neck crank was nasty yeah the way he had it and where he was going, people have no idea how painful that sucker is when that's being applied that way. Yeah, because the where he had his legs and, and the, the position he was pulling in, I don't blame medic at all. It, it was time to get out of there. Yeah, I think people think that it's more like you're trying to pull it across the arm, uh, across the jawline. You're not. You're actually no. put it across and then you're squeezing it into your chest. Yep. And that's what the difference is. Like you're thinking that you can just roll with it or try to like scoot. The, uh, scoot your hips out and get off from underneath with it. his leg yeah with his leg in, in, in there in so. that position where you need to go really the only thing he would have been able to do is just lift his chin if he could have and then give him the choke well, you give him the choke that's what i'm saying <laughs> but you give you, last ditch resort i mean you're, you're gonna tap with a jaw lock you might as well just give the neck and see what you can get maybe you can wiggle out who knows you never know uh, but i get i get it it's it's you're making a split decision uh choice and sometimes you don't have the time it hurts so bad uh, next fight. Uh, we had, man, this one was Joe Anderson Brito against Jonathan Pierce. <laughs> this, this fight had me a little bit laughing at points when, especially when they're talking to each other and stuff and don't say stupid stuff in a fight, <laughs> but I don't know. What did you think? Let me, let me hear your, your, it was a beautiful submission. He yeah. grabbed it fast. <clears throat> Jonathan Pierce made a mistake. Jonathan Pierce is a good fighter. Mm -hmm. He is a, he's a tough fighter. And uh, he made a mistake in that fight. 
Well, <clears throat> anytime someone locks in a choke like that, the ninja choke or that front rear naked, whatever you want to call it, um, your first reaction shouldn't be to keep driving in on the double leg. God, no. It's time, it's time to start it just, as soon as it, As soon as that arm goes underneath the chin and yep. you feel something start to go over the top, as soon as it goes under the chin, just turn and roll and fight another That's day. It. That's it. And he kept trying to push into the fence on the double leg. And once he set the chin over the top, I mean, no, it's no. damn near impossible to get out of. I mean, I'm sure I've seen guys probably break their neck getting out of there. Basically, it looks like you're yeah. close to breaking it to get out of it. And so I, I, I didn't understand that logic or he just thought, oh, it's not that bad, not that bad. But then I said the same thing about those type of chokes as I do with leg locks. Ah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Ah, shit, shit, shit. I'm tapping. No, you're not. Yeah. And so that's exactly what happened. And then by the time he tried to roll out, the chin was already over the top. The chin was over the top before he even tried to roll out. He had it blocked in. He, before right. he even turned his chin, he, he was already locked in. It just was stuck, man. It wasn't just... You got to make quicker decisions in those type of scenarios. Yeah, yeah, you know. I and when I'm when I'm talking about that fight, it's, you know, who did you have winning that fight up to that point? I had Pierce winning. Yeah, he's yeah. winning that fight, and it's like, this is what'll happen. You, you you don't there there. And what I was talking about is there was some verbiage. You could see them talking. And fighters talk all the time, you know. But Drives you're me looking, you go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like <laughs> quit talking and yeah. get rid of him because the longer that he stays you know he can always put you away and that's what happened you're winning the fight yeah. you know you're a good fighter you made a mistake and he caught you in it and that's yeah. what happens but you know it's one of those yep. you know, he's gonna learn from it he's gonna be a better better fighter overall based upon that loss oh yeah oh yeah all that's right we got jose johnson against chad englinger I can't even say the name, dude. Uh, Anna Liger. And him. And Helliger. Anna Liger. And Helliger. <laughs> Just I call apologize, him Chad. apologize, Chad. What up, Chad? Yeah. Talk to me. What'd you think? Actually, I was surprised that at the end, you know, that it got to the point where uh, Johnson, when he got the win, it was nice to see him continue on to get the finish <laughs> when he could have written it out a little bit, but. He was still going for the finish at the end. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. When you get to the point with only 12 seconds left and most guys will just kind of cruise, maybe yep. stand up, make space, and maybe try to do like a big flurry of punches to still the crowd. You know, uh, but no, he he stayed on the choke and kept working on it. Didn't let it go. He just who knows? Look, those are those are the things that your promoters are looking for. So yeah, I think that pro finishes. you know, look, if I can get a finish even with 12 seconds left, it means that I'm trying to get these guys out of here. That's right. So good on him. Good on him for yeah, doing that. It is. You know. Uh, they had the CLD Christian Leroy Duncan mm -hmm. against Dennis Talunian. I'll tell you what. This is the second fight that I've watched CLD. In, and in his first one, he lost in the UFC. But it, we all know that his stand-up is outstanding. He's got power. He's fast. He uses elbows well. He's going to be a, you know, a problem for some people once mm -hmm. he starts to get a little bit more under the belt as far as, you know, quality fights that he yeah. can, you know, sit on with people. You go in and say, all right, that guy was good. And he, he hit freaking Dennis with some massive shots. Yeah. Yeah, the elbows were, were just nasty. Yeah nasty i mean and he didn't just hit one he hit like a oh, combo no, he, of elbows. he, he whap, would sit there whap. with a the combo coming boom and come yeah. right back boom and i was like, like oh, oh damn damn that was yeah. nasty that um was good. i think it's as a ref you, the fight could have probably been stopped after a couple of the exchanges just yeah. seeing that yeah I, I get it i get it you gotta you gotta see the nail oh, in the coffin no. <laughs> but oh, i was like man you're taking just a lot of damage with nothing back like you have no. nothing coming back really so uh nasty elbows big shots you know and just it was it was it was pretty impressive pretty impressive for sure yep. all right anything else on there yeah we got to talk about the uh <laughs> the no said, contest man. man we got to talk about Trey the no Ogden contest. against nicholas mata we got to talk about that one okay mm. so let's talk about it what'd you think <sighs> he's john he made a mistake. my boy he's my, he's my boy but he made a mistake he made, oh yeah, and look at he was the first person to say i made a mistake yeah, but what you got to go off of what occurred. And everyone's got this. Yeah. I hate when people 
that have never done it have this great idea how easy it is <laughs> you know and you, you have to you have to always look at all is there, the is there somebody there. specifically you're talking about it is just saying just, you know people <laughs> just throw that out there. And, and just you have to understand all the elements because you know for mike beltran who is a great referee He's in a position where he see you know he knows the choke. He's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's been in that choke. Trust me, he's a, he's a big you know heavy guy. That's one of his chokes. Okay, when he sees the choke, he sees it going in. The one thing that people on the outside, both commentators, people in the stands, people watching on TV, the one thing that you don't get that he gets is the gurgle. Mm. Josh. How many times have you put chokes on people and they're snorting, making all kinds of sounds? Who yeah. hears that besides you? Nobody. Nope. Okay. And so the, one of the things that, you know, when Beltran is looking and you see him grabbing the arm, it's tough to get to the off arm because he'd have to kind of reach over mm -hmm. the fighter. So he's kind of stuck in trying the one that the guy's trying to defend and push against he's now kind of trying to use as his gauge of, is this guy still here or not? And he's hearing the gurgle. He's hearing the gurgle go on and he's asking the guy, show me you're there, show me you're there. And he's getting no response off of it. And so with that, you know, with athletic commissions, it's, I'm going to just say it straight. They would rather you stop it early than you stop it late. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see you stopping it late. So, you know that is right what's right you must through... not be talking about the texas commission then because <laughs> <laughs> what's riding yeah exactly what's riding through mike's mind is look i don't want to let this go on too long if he's out and i'm thinking that he's okay he's okay now i'm starting to think he's out based upon the gurgle that's happening and so he makes the decision to stop what he should the one thing he should have done is look at the body position of the person in to on top because that body position is going to tell you how long someone can last in the choke usually you know if the guy's putting it on right and everything's right and you saw that ogden was he was starting to take an angle himself <clears throat> off but he was still because he started it off in the mount mm -hmm. and he started to angle himself, but he still kind of had his knee on belly and he did not sink his hips down which is going to make it a little bit tighter there's all these little elements those are all things that he could have seen but what would be nice i'm just going to say off of this is you can take a look and say it sucks that that was called a no contest because mm. Trey Ogden deserved to win. He did. He won the fight. If you're going to look at the judges scorecards, he won the fight. If you're going to look at that choke, Mata might've made it through it, but he wasn't going to go anywhere from it. He was going to still be on his back. And there was what a minute 49 left when the mm. fight was stopped. So you look and you say, it should be, it should have the ability, since we have instant replay and we have all these things that are out there, it should be that the referee can make the decision that it is a no contest, or he can make the decision that, hey, I screwed that up, and we're going to go to the judge's scorecards. I'm going to have them score what part of the third round they saw, and we'll go to the scorecards and get a winner based on, upon the fact that, yes, I stopped the fight, but it was a mistake. So we'll go and we'll have the judges score that fight. Not too sure uh, about that, think, huh? Josh. What do you think? I'm not. I'm not too sure about that. I mean, how many? I know it doesn't happen a lot, but how many times have we seen a fight where a guy was dominating the fight and guy yeah. was able to get a scramble and get back to his feet and land a flying knee or okay. land whatever shot they got? But what did I say? Fight. But what did I say? Oh, they made it sound. It, what I got from you was we're going to go to the instant replay. We're going to go back no. to, to the judges' scorecards and we're going no, to score. No, I said from he there. has the choice. Oh, okay. So the choice is, I can go to a no contest, or I can go to the judges' scorecards. And let's be honest: if you know, and most referees know exactly who's winning the fight, and they know, oh, he's absolutely winning this fight, or this guy's been getting his ass kicked the whole mm -hmm. time, and luckily got into this position, I'm going to say it's a no contest. I'm not going to give something to someone you know i'm not going to give a loss to someone that doesn't deserve the loss either if i can you try to make it as fair as possible no you try you try i get what you're saying you i understand i understand what you're you saying you can't make it perfect you screwed it you screwed mm -hmm. up 
All right. So the best you can do is say, hey, look, I screwed up, which Mike Beltran did. Mm -hmm. He went to the commission and said, I screwed that up, you know, which means I'm not going to give, you know, uh, uh, a loss to someone when, yeah, he, he was losing the fight, yeah. but, you know, I stopped it when he was still there. But it's, they should have the ability to say if they want it to go to the judges' scorecards or if they want it to be a no contest. The you reason why the I difference. say no is because we say Mota wasn't going to win, but we just don't know. You're right. You don't. For sure. And so that's why I, I would, I know it's not but fair, let, but the no but, contest has got to stay. Well, let's let's be honest. You watch the first round; it's pretty easy. Who won the first round? No, I get it. I, I no, understand. I get no. You're, you're 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 the you're the referee inside of the the cage. Are you gonna are you gonna have an idea of who is winning that first round? Absolutely. Okay, are you gonna have an idea of who is winning the first, the second? Absolutely. And are you gonna have a big idea of who is winning the third? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay, but you also know that fighters can make mistakes. Fight, look, you keep a fighter in a fight long enough, and it can happen in that last minute and a half. I, I, you, we can't. I can't go giving guys wins off of my mistake. I just, I wouldn't be able to do it. And as much as and it's my fuck up, I get it. But I, you don't know. We none of us the, know. And to say that the we do know, part, it's yeah. just not true. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the hardest part is, I don't give a shit about the win. The I don't give a shit about what it says in the win column mm -hmm. or the loss column. Yeah, what I do care about is deserves his money exactly yeah now when you're the referee that's what you, you go man i just took money out of that guy's pocket yeah now luckily and let's let's put this out there the ufc paid him his win bonus yeah okay which is the right thing to do thank god they did it it was you know that's that's what a, a good promotion is going to do because he deserved it because that's what's important to him because no matter what when a fighter is in a contract and it says 12 and 12 and someone asks him, how much money you can make in this fight? He goes right away. $24,000. He has already mentally spent 24,000, not 12. Yeah. So he knows exactly where that money's going and, and you know, all the different things. Get it. And so the most important part was that Trey Ogden. Yeah. He didn't get a win in the column like he should have, but he did get his win bonus. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a shit situation if you're the ref to it be in, sucks. man. And I and I it's like horrible. I like I like Beltran a lot. So it's horrible. Hey, you do it enough, right, John? I mean, like what you would do? How many fights a year? Fights, I would not, do, not promotions. How many no, fights no, a year? Would actual you do? fights that I yeah. refereed a year. Uh, near the end, I was doing about six hundred to seven hundred fights a year. There you go. That's a lot of fights. Yeah, you're bound to fuck up a couple times. <laughs> just the way it goes man i'm sorry that the is... way it goes it sucks on you know to be a ref on that side but it is what it is fighters you know gotta just gotta deal with it man that's the way we are all right uh we're gonna go ahead and jump into the bellator talk before we do though go to onlyfans.com slash weighing in onlyfans.com slash weighing in i had a meeting with them this week i put up some extra content on there you for you guys from our chicago show and um we did a live yesterday over there as well, right before John's internet took a crash. <laughs> but uh, I had to actually wrap uh, the show on my own. But it was it was fun. Baby. We, had, we had a good time. We had a good time. It was and then fun. you started this one on your own. Yeah, yeah. We were able to get him back. That we reeled him in. Just keeps keeps yeah. rolling on. <laughs> it's, but uh, follow us over there. We do not charge for for our OnlyFans account. You guys can come on over. We've got we've received quite a bit in in tips. If you guys are interested in tipping on our content. Ooh, More yeah. than welcome to do that as well. But <laughs> we uh, we want to thank you guys for continuing your support from this platform to that platform to Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, all these places and locations that we play on iTunes, everything. Uh, our audio platforms have grown quite a bit. So continue to support us and subscribe to us there as well. But we are on OnlyFans.com slash Wayne in. And we want to thank you guys so much for continuing to support us over there. Thank you guys. All right, Dave, let's go. What do you got for Bellator? <sighs> Bellator 301 from Chi Town at the Wintrust Arena. Well, there was a lot of changing of of uh, championships. Yeah, two championship fights, two belts exchanged hands, mm -hmm. and uh, Jason Jackson taking on the undefeated Yaroslav Amazov. Well, that is no longer something you can say wow. because he definitely got beat in that one. Jason Jackson came out. 
and just put an ass whooping. He is called the ass kicking machine, and he was kicking ass while Ar- where Amazov was basically he was finding everything that he did rough. Mm-hmm. He was having a hard time with everything. Uh, it was a, I mean, it was a beautiful performance. If you're looking at Jason Jackson, you're saying, man, you, you know what? You stayed long. Your wrestling defense was on point because a guy in Amazov who has been able to take down, you know, NC2A Division One champions like Ed Ruth, All-Americans like Logan Storley, he was, he, I think it was zero for 13. Wow. Takedown attempts. Yeah. It's crazy to think, right? I mean, he's, he's had success in taking guys down like Ed Ruth, three-time national champ out of Penn state. I mean, he think some of the guys he's fought, he's been able to stuff their takedowns, take them down as well. It's, it was impressive. Jason Jackson, we've, people don't respect his wrestling because if it's, whether it's his body style or whether it's the way that he fights, he comes from a wrestling background. Yeah. And you can watch somebody, he, he looks to be like a little bit like unorthodox in his style of wrestling, but it works for him, man. His body style, his, his leverage that he can create, the way he can wizard, the way he can get his hips back. And then what I loved was he never let Amosov go unscathed. What I mean by that is every time he stopped the takedown, he threw a knee up he, the gut. He, he threw a it. shot. He yep. threw something off of the break and just let him know, like, no, no, every time you shoot, yeah. I'm, I'm going to make that you exit. pay. On that yeah. exit, when I'm going to break away from you, I'm going to leave you with something to remember. And Absolutely. I mean, he, in every exchange, he finished with a knee. He finished with a shot. He finished with something. Whether it was wrestling or not, he just looked good, man. He looked really, really good. And I know I, I keep tooting my own horn, but I'm going to keep saying it. I figured that this guy would be, Jason Jackson would give him the hardest go. Yeah, he, he said did. it for a long time. You know, he gave him, it was everything. It was the, the style in which he fights. Jason Jackson is, he he looks like a, just a normal kickboxer. He looks like just a normal fighter. But he just does things in, he, he's, it's hard to fight, a like, like, I guess for me, it's hard to fight or train for guys that are street fighters. And I'm not saying he's out there fighting the streets. No, but he's a guy he that there's, from. yeah. And so when you're fighting those kind of guys, you're, you're dealing with someone who doesn't let you escape. Like you just don't back off the fence and circle away and get back out in the middle. And no, no, no. He broke away and he didn't, he wasn't letting you break away to go out there and let's fight from, you know, from a square stance. No, no, you break away. I'm chasing after you with a shot, a jab in the face, a big right hand kick to the body or knee. I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to let you know that no matter where we decide to take this fight, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. And he, he, his mentality, his mental, all that stuff, you could tell that he was mentally ready that whole time. His mentality was spot on. It was the one thing out of this whole thing. You know, I love you. Know, he's as, he's as uh, you know, respectful as you can be. And I say this all the time. You know, one of the things I love about Jason Jackson is I've known him for a long time, and he's a late bloomer, for one. He's just gotten, you know, when he first started in his career, there was a lot of holes there and he made big mistakes and he got hurt at times in fights and stuff, but you could see the potential. And now he has absolutely filled in those holes where now that's not a deficit. It's a benefit. Mm-hmm. He's able to do things in a way that makes him very difficult for people to match up with. He's got an incredibly long reach. He's kind of like Morales. We were talking about, you know, at the USC, he's got a 79 inch reach. I mean, that is freaking long in the welterweight division. And he fights long and he fights smart in the stand up. He, he, he knows when to just touch and he knows when to lay in with a big shot. Mm-hmm. And if he wants, he can wrestle you. He'll take you to the ground. He, he took Douglas Lehman to the ground how many times? And with Amazon, he just basically said i think that i am better in the stand-up than you and you're going to try to wrestle me and i'm going to stop everyone he stonewalled how many takedowns and as you said it was all the damage that he created off of stopping the takedown and then making him pay for attempting that takedown yeah. it just started to add up yeah um yeah he just he had answers for everything he came mentally yep. prepared and 
I've been saying for the longest time that Amosoft was the best world toy in the world, and Jason Jackson made it look easy. You know, oh, yeah. um, you know, and people were saying that, oh, Amosoft looked a little off. I had several people tell me that. I'm like, no, he didn't look off. Just Jason Jackson fought a, a he, brilliant fight. I think Jason Jackson made him look off. Yeah. That's the way to look at it. Yeah, that's the way to look at it. Like, I, yep. We give, we keep, we got, not just we, but like people, like not just about Amosoft. I'm talking about other fighters as well. They, we have a tendency to not give the person who's coming up the credit they deserve. We have a tendency to say, oh, someone so just, he looks slow. Oh, he looked like this. I, I've said these things before, but I said it based off of like when I saw Islam fight um, Volkanovsky, the first fight. I said, I texted you. I said, he looks flat. He looks like, you know, his before. body, his body looks smooth. Yeah. Like right before, yeah, before. Like right before they fought. It was Just like, like I texted right. you that Jason Jackson looks good. He looked good inside there. Like, you know, the way that their body <laughs> I was like, hey, out. Jason, he looks good. He's ready. You, you know? can tell by the way, they're, oh, yeah. the way their bodies, when they walk in, their body fills out. Amosov yep. looked phenomenal too. Shredded in the abs. Looked, you know, his body looked, he looked good at weigh-ins. He looked good, you know, um, warming up. He looked all those things. Mm-hmm. It just it wasn't his night. Jason Jackson yeah. fought a fucking brilliant fight. But brilliant. How how many times have we say styles make fights? And there's gonna be oh, guys, yeah. and this is what you were talking about with you know your predictions before of you know, if I was gonna say there's one guy that could give Amazon problems, it's Jason Jackson. You said it multiple times. Mm-hmm. I agreed with you on it because then just the the style that he has and that just happened to play out. He mm-hmm. is a difficult fight. For Amazon, Amazon's going to have to go back to the drawing board and look yeah. at how do I attack this guy in a different fashion? Because what I did, you know, on the, you know, the 17th, that did not work and it's not going to work the next time either. So yeah. I've got to change it up. Yeah, here's we we've always we've said this for the longest time also is that now there's a blueprint. Yeah. And so you, he's going to have to be careful. He's going to have to make a couple tweaks here and there. Don't change what he does too much, but he's got to, I've said, I've said this about him privately. Cause you know, I don't want to be out there publicly saying this is the way he fights, but he fights in a rhythm. He fights in like a dance. It's like he moves, he, he bounces, he, and fighters start to, they start to have tells like Amanda Hebus about how um, she just, she gives the feints and this and that. So she, it makes it out. easier for you. Yeah, she squares out. It makes it easier for you to know when to throw the push kick up the middle to the gut. It makes it easier for you to know, like, oh, he, he likes to shoot takedowns off of that that combination when he when he throws. You know what I mean? So those are all tells that people can start to figure out. Fighters go home and watch. He Jason Jackson said, "I watch a lot of re- I watch a lot of fa- tape on him." Yeah, he also he has, said it, the best part he said is, "I ain't fighting his record. I'm fighting yeah. the man." That's true, man. That's that's a yeah. mental breakthrough for well, a lot of people. You got to learn to do that. Yeah. So, next fight. Ah, we had Patchy Mix taking on Sergio Pettis for the Bantamweight Championship. Patchy Mix coming off of being the winner of the Million Dollar World Grand Prix in the Bantamweights. Uh, Sergio was not part of that based upon he had hurt his knee and had knee surgery. Then he came back and beat Patricio Pitbull in a matchup where Pitbull came down to 135 to try to win three different weight classes. That did not happen because Pettis looked fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so this matchup was one they had trained together earlier in their careers and stuff, but coming in, you were looking at patchy mix, mostly, you know, looking to get the fight to the ground and Sergio Pettis trying to keep it on the feet. And that was not something he was able to do throughout any of it. He survived the first round, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, did a good job of, you know, just taking a little bit of abuse, but, you know, keeping himself safe. But it came to that second round. As soon as Patchy took the back, yeah. you saw right away entwine the arm with his leg and you go, oh, you're in trouble. Here it comes. Yeah, I said on the uh, on the live uh, that we did yesterday on OnlyFans that – one of the first guys that I ever trained with in jujitsu was BJ Penn. And that was like his trademark. Oh, he used and to do that all the time. And if you go back and you watch the fight when he won the welterweight world title against Matt Hume, Matt Hughes, Matt Hughes, it, yeah. Matt Hughes is that he did the same thing to him. Yep. He trapped that arm and he just took the rear naked. You've got one hand to defend with. It's damn near impossible to stop. Yep. I mean, he Horrible. sucked it in and boom was done. Patchy did a great job of throwing that leg over trapping the arm. 
Sergio had no answer for it. There's just there's not much you can do about just it. Just a matter of time. Yeah, it was just, just a matter of time at that point. You go, yep. ah, he's done. As long as that arm is trapped, you are stuck. Yeah, you know, uh, and and I gotta be honest, that being caught like that in training, like I had got caught like that by BJ um, one night training it was the first time I'd ever trained with him. He caught me twice with that same move within like within like a three or four minute match. <laughs> I was like, that that actually led me to quit my job and just start training full time. Cause I was like, there's just no way there's guys out there that are this good. And I was like, he was good. So good. And so it made me, it made me a better fighter And this, in this scenario, Sergio will definitely be a better fighter because of it. But Apache mix is just, he's on another level right now. He's his confidence is there. His uh, relationship with Tatiana Suarez. I think also the two of them being so ingrained with each other, yep. you know, driving to the gym together, coming home together, eating the same stuff together, relaxing the same times, understanding what, you know, what each other's go through during fight camps, all of that stuff. It, it seems like the two of them have been able to make that scenario work. A lot of fighters have tried to date other fighters. <laughs> this shit don't work, man. Yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes work. it doesn't. I'll you know. tell you what, for him, she has been the best thing that has happened mm -hmm. to him because ever since he met up with her, his entire, you know, I don't want to say attitude because he's always had the attitude that he was going to be champion. Mm -hmm. But his attitude towards training has absolutely intensified to the point where he understands now what it takes to obviously, obviously he understands what it takes to be a champion. He is one, but he's going to be a hard person to dethrone because he's not that guy that's going to sit there and not have things about each fighter that he brings out that he wants to, mm -hmm. you know, go after and stuff. He is a nightmare when it comes to the 135 pound division. I, I think honestly, John, I, I take a look at the, the landscape in MMA right now. I think he's the best grappler in the sport. I think he's the best grappler in the sport. One that gets it done inside the cage. Like I, well, I could say, like you could say, uh, guys that here, have better accolades in here, ADCC, here, 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 but here's the thing. Here's the thing to bring up. If Dave pull, pull up his record real quick, cause I know what it's going to say. You know, there's one decision that I can think of that was Horiguchi. He's got one loss that was to Archuleta where, you know, he was young as far as, you know, truly knowing how to fight mm -hmm. and made big mistakes in that. But if you take a look, all right, we got submission, knockout, submission. There's the decision against Horiguchi. Submission, submission. Oh, and he's got the loss to uh, Archuleta. Like I said, submission, mm -hmm. submission, submission. TKO, submission, submission. He's a finisher. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just fight. He puts you away. And that's the thing, you know, when you're looking at him as a fighter, it's like, hey, you're trying to survive, you know, making it, you know, through the entire fight with him because he's that good when the fight hits the ground. And yeah. now, you know, I know, you know, we had Eric Nixick on the show. He said, you know, we said, you know, hey, you know, who's the best band away? He, he said, Apache Mix is. Hmm. And he was right because, you know, he proved it again with this fight. And it's a matter of it ain't going to change. I don't care where he fights. Mm -hmm. He is the boogeyman. And he's going to be the boogeyman in the band and weight division if he continues in the pattern that he is in now, making fighting his number one thing, you know, training all the time, eating right, doing all these things instead of going out with the buddies, he goes to the gym. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that, you know, Tatiana Suarez has really changed with him because she likes to go to the gym. So they go to the gym. She doesn't, mm -hmm. she's not a partier. Mm -hmm. She's a gym rat. Well, mm -hmm. so is he. And he's got the right mentality and he's got the right partner. And he's definitely got the talent to keep, winning yeah. championship for a long time well this is the thing though i get nervous with him just like i was you know when i look at guys like aljamain sterling they don't have great stand-up and so they're gonna have to they're gonna have to find ways to get these things to the you've to always got to work at making it better yeah always the difference that i see between aljo and the things i see between patchy mix is that patchy like he'll shoot double legs but he doesn't need to shoot double legs he waits for you to kind of get into that distance and he'll grab a hold of you over under you. And then he'll basically shrug the arm by, get to the back, whatever it is. He'll find ways to duck around and get to your back. 
Um, Aljo does a great job too at closing the distance, shooting on the single or the double, and then switching to the single, driving to the fence. Um, but both of them have to work out a little bit um, their abilities on the feet because you don't want to run into a Paul Craig situation where these guys are getting so good on the feet where your wrestling is True. just left behind. You have to continuously to be developing your ways of getting things to the ground, foot sweeps, you know, inside trips, outside trips, you know, shrugging their arm by using, you know, you're, they're going to have to really develop those things because these young, these smaller, not smaller, these 135 pound fighters, they evolve so fast. One guy does one thing and the next, you know, all of them are using it. And then you got to create something else to, yeah. They do it so fast. The heavyweights and two or five pounders, it's not as frequent. They're they're not evolving the game as much in the upper weight classes. You well, know what I mean? It's it's you don't have to be truthfully, you don't have to be as well rounded and as good everywhere. Yeah. In the heavier weights that you do to be successful in the in the lower weights. Lower weights, it, you got to be good everywhere. Yeah. And to sit there and, you know, to talk right now about Patchy's stand-up, his stand-up is not bad. No, it's not bad. And, it, and it's getting better. And his knees Absolutely. are getting really good. And his kicks up the middle are getting good. Everything is, you know, when you're good at something, you tend to work that mm -hmm. a lot. And you go, oh, I'll do the other one. Yeah. Do that later. Well, I think he's smart enough to say, I need to just continue to get better in my stand-up because that's going to be the difference maker. Well, I look at also too, is that he's not just a triangle guy with the long legs. He's not just a guillotine guy with the long arms. I mean, he's, he's hitting the Darces, the Anacondas, the guillotines, the, the front rear naked chokes. He's hitting them all from his back, his butt. He's hitting the, Sulu, he's hitting the Suluev stretches. He hits everything. Yes. And so when I, when I'm, when I'm saying the guys like guys like Paul Craig or other, other jujitsu fighters that, they they're this they go this way he's hitting it from everywhere he wants to be on top he doesn't just hang out on the bottom he hits the sweep gets to the top attacks all of those things he's hands down i think the best jiu-jitsu guy right now in in the sport but like i said all in this lighter weight classes they develop they they pay attention they see what you do oh, a lot yeah. they understand the oh he's not this he's not that you know him and the sean o'malley i mean like if i was to say oh, that would sean, be so good It'd be a great fight. It would be so good. It'd be a great fight. Yeah. I mean, both. I, I want to know how they both adjust to having to fight someone that is similar in height and size. Absolutely. Like that, that becomes a problem now because you're like, wait, I've never fought someone as tall as me. Wait, I've never fought someone as tall as me. I've never fought someone like, you know, like Sean's good on the ground. I think Patchy's yeah, yes. better. But if I look at who's got better stand up, it's Sean's sorry, got better stand up. There's no doubt. I think exactly. Patchy is, Patchy's better on the ground than Sean, and Sean is better yep. in the stand up than patchy it comes down to who makes a mistake that's it and but it's, it makes, makes it for so cool it makes it for such a fun fight and yeah. this is the styles make matchup type scenario it really is you know um because if i was to put marab in patchy if i was to put well aljo, if i was to put aljo in patchy marab, marab, marab and patchy train together all the time yeah and no, so I mean, I'm, no, I think, I'm just, I think, I'm saying, I think, yeah, that one's not going to happen. So, but no, I, well, they're in different organizations also. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm simply saying like, when you say those three guys, right, they're mainly jujitsu, mainly wrestling, mainly, you know, so yeah. those, that fight, those three fights, they're great fights. I would love to see all three of those fights, you know, Marab and, and, and Aljo, Marab and Patchy. I'd love to see Patchy and uh, Aljo and, you know, and so on. But Sterling poses a, uh, an, I was going to Sterling, but uh, Sean. Sean O'Malley poses a different threat on the feet, but good enough on the ground to maybe stifle whatever Patchy can do. Patchy, good enough on the feet to kind of stifle whatever he does on the feet. But we, I think the better fighter on the ground. Just the two, that makes for a very fun fight. Oh, yeah. All right, next fight. Ah, uh, we had Rafian Stotts with Danny Sabatello in a rematch that was part of the Bantamweight Grand Prix. Uh, a lot of bad blood. These guys do not like each other. And it just continued on. But this was, I mean, this was a great fight as yeah. far as you're looking at ground techniques and guys really going out. You, I always say spider monkeys. You say ferrets. They're like two ferrets on the ground, two spider monkeys. They were all over each other. And there was some great techniques beautiful elevations and, and switching of positions reversals were happening you know some good shots 
were landed by Stotts in that. Sabatello landed some stuff. You could see that Sabatello really learned from the first one of, hey, I got to be busy on the ground. I got to go after him. It's just you can see at times tough for Danny Sabatello when he's facing a guy who can also wrestle and is a scrambler. Yeah, It's tough for him to let go of his hands and think of, okay, I'm going to lose control to try to land some damaging strikes. You got to take the chance, man. Yeah. That's the thing. Like in this scenario, you knew it was three rounds. You got to take the chances. And uh, he came up short. I had him coming up short. He actually, yeah. Stotts came out more prepared in the wrestling department, like he said. And I thought Danny came out a lot better on the feet also. But you got to set up the head kicks. Like the first couple you threw were fantastic. And then, you know, you snuck yeah. one in here and there. But then every time you got to the feet, it was just the same head kick. No setup, no hide behind nope. the jab, throw the head kick, no dip in the head, and then throwing the head kick off of it. Yeah, you um, went back to the well on that that yeah, head kick, the head kick time too much. The time. And then but when you're going to the well that much on the head kick, start going to the body. If you know you're gonna throw the head kick that much, then go to the body. Because if you catch him to the body one or two times, it changes the tempo of the fight. So I was surprised uh that he kept just doing that so much. But look, I, I don't care. To me, I'd watch that fucking fight seven or eight I times. I watch those guys do the same <laughs> thing. So good. I enjoy them. I enjoy the scrambles. I enjoy the trash talk. I enjoy. I enjoy all of that part of it. I. I think the two of them. I mean, I know that Stas doesn't doesn't need to take the fight again after winning. You know, the first two. No. But like he said, if you want to pay me to punch him in the face, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Sabatello, I think you know he's going to continue to want it back. Oh yeah, you'd always want that fight back. So yeah. good fight overall, though. But it was a good fight. It was an entertaining yeah. fight. They they really went after it. It was it, it shows what grappling can really be entertaining yeah. in the fight game when it's done the way they did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next fight. AJ McKee against Sydney Outlaw. This was a strange one. This is this is this goes back to you know kind of what we talked about with Sabatello and Stotts in their first fight. Yeah. You know, because, and we said, you know, we talked about Sydney Outlaw, that Sydney's grappling is damn good, and he's yeah. heavy on top, and he creates problems for people. And he must be he just was, like cock strong. Oh, yeah. Because the way he was able to keep sucking in AJ, I was like, holy shit. He yeah. must be really strong. And when I talked to uh, Adam Piccolotti about it, he's like, oh, he didn't really feel that strong. But Adam's someone that didn't fight the takedowns as much. So yeah, you don't feel as much strength. Him. Yeah, he floated with it, tried to scramble off of it. Man, but he he just seemed physically strong. Well, you know, we we knew that Sydney likes to take the fight to the ground. We knew that if he wanted to be in the standoff with AJ, that probably wasn't going to work out well for him. So he did the right thing in trying to take the fight to the ground. The problem was he's controlling. He's not fighting. This is not a wrestling match, and AJ is sitting there, and he's landing elbow after elbow after elbow, punch, punch, and Sydney is landing body shots. Yeah, That's not going to do it, man. You have got to do something as far as trying to land big shots, damaging shots to AJ with elbow strikes or punches to the head. You know, you can go to the body, body, head if you want every now and then, but Judges are looking for you to do damage. You've got to show that you're trying to finish the fight. And in this, let's just be honest. You know, you, you take a look at both guys. AJ didn't have a mark on him. That's true. After the fight. Not a mark on him. And Sydney was lumped up. Yeah. He was cut. He was lumped up. And, you know, AJ, for the most part, was on his back based upon the great grappling and uh, wrestling that Sydney was putting out there. But Sydney lost every round. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it, it was, I know, had the first I'm, round close, but then he lost, was like, close. he lost two and three. First round was close, but he lost two and three for sure. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You know, and you looked at that and it's like, it's hard for people to understand. It's like, Hey, you know, a lot of uh, guys out of uh, the, the South beach area there that, you know, Sydney's training and they were kind of like, oh, how, he was on top. It's not about being on top. Mm -hmm. It's about trying to finish the fight and doing damage. Yeah. It's a fight. It's not a goddamn wrestling match. <laughs> and it's a matter of, you know, you know I really thought that uh, Sydney would try to open up a little bit more from that position. He never was able to. Yeah. And AJ definitely deserves the win. Yeah. 
Next fight though was a. It was a, nice to see the judges yeah. actually. Yes. Do that. You know. Okay? It was because nice. That's sometimes they won't. So good job. Then we had Alexander Shabley going against Patricky Pitbull Frede. Man, I'll tell you what. You talk about just a beautiful exhibition in the stand-up. You know, I, I, I'll give Patricky all day long. Dude, that dude's got heavy fucking brass balls. Yeah, he does. He is tough. He takes shots. He keeps coming forward. Uh, Shabley put a ton of shots on him throughout that fight. Yeah a ton and he kept on coming he got hurt and this kept coming yeah. and uh by the end of that you know patricky was not looking very good and the next day i know that he's not gonna look good at all but shabley just proved how technically good he is he is technically just an outstanding status slick he does some truly slick stuff with his footwork you saw how many times when we talk about angles and creating angles and you see Shabley's in a position with Pitbull right in front of him but uh -huh. Pitbull's looking in that direction and Shabley can just sit there and open uh -huh. up and there's nothing for Pitbull to do besides try to turn his body and you go yeah just that's what a technician can do to you he's good man I've sparred with him I've worked with him before when he was younger and he was a sniper on the feet he didn't have the wrestling quite as much as he does now yeah. um but but man he was slick back then on the feet and then now i see with him before he was very much just straight up and down like hands here good technique defensive fighter and then make you pay now the relaxation's there so yeah. things come from angles and speed that's just so relaxed that you can't see him coming because there's no load up it's just slick and smooth and with Patricky, you can see the load up. He sits down, he loads up and throws the big power. He yeah. just didn't have the chance to get in there. He did land some big shots on, on Shabley and a couple of exchanges. A couple of times. But just uh, it wasn't enough, you know. And, and, and you really have to get – there was times that Pitbull really opened up, taking big mm -hmm. chances, trying to get after him. Was it? Yeah. The first time I ever saw Alexander Shabley fight was in his hometown. It was in Rostovodon, Russia. and. Uh, he was much more boxing centric back mm -hmm. then than he is now. He really utilizes the front kick and he opens up with kicks to the body really well now. And that's just added to how dangerous he is. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm seeing that he's, he's evolving with his stand up and he's getting better everywhere, man. I'll tell you what, that dude is yeah. a, he's problems for anybody. Yep. I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. Um, you know, whether it's against Usman or whoever else is next. I mean, we already saw him. He's knocked out Brent Primus. Yep. I mean, he's he's on another level right now. His confidence, he's so nice, too. Like, super just casual about his fighting style. But when he gets in there, he's a stone-cold killer. That kid, he, he wants to finish the fight. He fought when he fought Tofik. It was a little slow pace. But he was just slowly picking Tofik apart. Slowly. And then the push kicks and the push kicks. And then the pick, pick, pick. He was... He was just, winning, you know, nine out of ten of the exchanges yeah. with Tofik. Yeah. And Tofik's a good striker. Tofik likes to be in the stand up. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Good fight though. That that was one of my more that was one of my favorite fights on the card. I wasn't yeah. sure if how it would shape out because it was gonna be five rounds. Patrick has a tendency to wait, let the fight develop in front of him and pick his and, and choose his shots to explode or his times to explode. Or Shabley, he can just sit on the outside and just sniper you to death. Yeah. So I was like, okay, look, this could end up being a boring fight or it could end up being a, a great fight. But it ended up being a great fight for five rounds. I was very impressed. It was a great fight. And, Next fight. And really, I got to give it up for Patricky one more time. Dude, big balls, brother. Yeah. You are a fighter at heart, man. Tough dude. Ah, we had Archie Colgan against Peter Boust. It is Boust. That's how you Boust. say it. I got okay. that right. Okay. But, uh, not a good performance by Archie as far as not what you expected from him. Yeah. He, he, he won the fight. He won every round, no doubt about it, but he's been absolutely making big strides in this one. And mm -hmm. this one was almost like a setback because, and it was the, the length, mm -hmm. the length of Bows, how tall he is. Uh, it's, it was one of those learning things for Archie because you know, everyone expects big things out of him. He's got great wrestling. His standup is good. He can take a shot. 
he's got power in his hands but you could see that the the length of Baust gave him some problems in the stand-up he would take it to the ground dominated there but could not get the fight to the point he could get the finish yeah and in, in this one you kind of looked and said that's what should have been the aim but wasn't able to get it done yeah, I liked the, the uh, Anaba and Killholtz fight, both getting after Great each fight. other. Great fight. Yeah. You know, Anaba coming, taking her first L, you yeah. know, on the record. But, uh, but look who I she, think... she, she did a stand up battle mm -hmm. against, you know, and you can look at this. Denise is about 15 fights into her MMA career. Anaba, I think that was her seventh fight. But Denise has got 50 kickboxing fights. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. and she went through a kickboxing contest. She didn't really try to take Denise down. Mm -hmm. Denise didn't you know, one time kind of try to take her down a little bit. It was a kickboxing battle, and it was just the, a little bit more by Denise. And the big difference was Denise being a complete big kickboxer, using her kicks a lot, where Anaba was more boxing-centric mm -hmm. and used mostly their, her hands in the stand-up. Yeah, I agree. You've got, like... And Nava should have threatened a couple takedowns. Yep. Not saying you need to get them. You gotta you gotta threaten them to keep Just Denise. Make her think about it. Keep her loyal to her her, her defense in there and her stand up there. Keep her thinking about it. So then they tendency to drop the hands to try and you know defend the, the legs. Yeah. Those type of things are important. Uh Hizrev versus Justin Gonzalez. Man, come on. Josh. Oh, good, man. Dude, he looks my wife was there at the fights and she's like she goes, he was fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, oh, you like what you saw there? And he, she goes, oh, my God, he, just everything, right? Yeah. And he pulled off he pulled off the Kerry Colot backflip mm -hmm. as Justin was trying <laughs> for the, the takedown on the one. He did everything. He just, Justin Gonzalez is a good fighter. He is a good he fighter. He is tough. He's in shape. He's a good wrestler. He's got hands. He'll stand and bang. And Tamur Hizrev just took him apart yeah took him apart in that fight just he's good yeah and fun to watch he's gonna be yeah he's gonna be dangerous he's young too what is he like 28 29 something like that yeah i think he's like just getting into I his believe. prime yeah 28 yeah. 29 he's just getting into his prime is that uh, 14 and 0 or 15 and 0 ah uh, i think he's 15 something in there yeah not matos <laughs> what are you can't, doing can't click no. he's trying can't he's click. trying to click over there don't even worry about it dave it's okay yeah. Um, but Carrie Melendez, who is not in her prime, but still, no, but still put on a good show, man. You could tell that she was getting tired in that fight. I don't yeah. even know how you say this girl's last name, but the other girl, Sengu. That she fought, Sengu. uh, but Carrie Melendez looked fantastic. You know, I was able to walk in the back, say congratulations to her. Um, you know, you could tell there was little emotions involved that she's, you know, 38 years old, 39, 39. years old. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy no. to, you know. To go out difference. there and run those miles. It's not easy to to go in there and try to fight, you know, with these fighters that are just they are constantly just training, constantly getting better. And uh she in her own right is a fantastic kiss kickboxer. But she's worked and she's been working with, you know, the Diaz brothers, with her husband Gilbert Melendez, and you know, obviously Jake Shields. She slapped on that guillotine. Very nicely done. She made Jake proud. She did. Very, <laughs> she very did. impressive. I thought. I thought good for her, man. Good for her. So she's uh she's come a long ways. So I'm gonna wonder if she's gonna keep fighting. She's this was this was her first fight at 125. She's normally at 115. This was her first fight at 125. She's she's not a big girl, so she's uh you know so having a fight in that weight class up above, uh, good for her. I know I think she missed weight though. I was gonna say crazy. she missed weight. <laughs> but before we before we we stay you know, like. Females go through a little different process in terms of the, Absolutely. The, the weight cuts. You don't, we don't know, but you never do. There's a lot of little things that can go on with a female weight cut. So I, I tend to give the females a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a break. I do a too. break on the weight cut yeah. situation, especially if you only, what she missed it by like 0.06 point or something. Oh, point point two. Two. Okay. Point so two. yeah, tough, but she, I thought she looked good. She looked tired a little bit in that second round, but she looked yeah, good. And you could tell it because the weight cut, you know, she had problems with it. Yeah. So, but uh, Mateus Matos taking on Richard Palencia. It was a good back and forth battle, and it was amazing that right at the point where Richard Palencia lands a right hand that puts Matos down, yeah, was the point that Matos jumped back up and then quickly got a rear naked choke in there and 
put him away. He was winning the whole fight, you know, and uh, realized I'm not going to stay and play anymore. I'm going to put this guy away, and he was able to. That was a nice win, but that, that was a good back and forth battle. Yeah, but Matos was usually winning the exchanges in it. Uh, John, you know, is there any other fights on here you want to talk about? I did want to talk about the Tim Wild and Mike Camel fight. I thought okay. that was a, I thought that was a great performance by that Tim Wild. That was a fantastic performance. But I did want both guys, yeah, both guys. But Tim yeah. Wild really looking good. He, you talk about a guy that's getting you know up in years as far as he's thirty four, thirty five now. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, but he's really fighting better than ever now at this age. This is a, this is his time because he was in control of that fight. You know, it started off, Mike Hamill was doing some good things. And when he finally figured out the range and how to mm-hmm. stop Hamill a little bit in the takedowns, Tim Wilde just was putting some shots on Hamill. This is the way that, see, that you said that. That's what I wanted to talk about was this is why you don't, if you're winning the fight, which Mike Hamill was winning the first round and then halfway, yeah. I would say even more into the second round. I had Mike Hamill winning rounds one and two. But towards the end of this, I, toward the I, end of the second. I had him winning round one. I remember. I don't remember. I, I had him winning round two also. But, but towards the end of the second, he started slowing down and kind of like letting, trying to stay on the outside, just touch, touch. And Tim Wilde just started kind of, instead of him, Tim Wilde being on the outside, he then took the center of the cage and just started pushing, not pushing my camel around, but making my camel fight him at a distance and then lunge in, lunge out. Yeah. I don't know what was done or what happened for him to start fighting that way. But as soon as that started happening, he looked like he got more tired. He looked not his takedowns weren't working. Mike Hamill, I've seen him go in a dog fight for three rounds. Get yep. and getting just hit with big shots and then coming back and then landing his own shots. I mean, his last fight was a fantastic fight. It was a draw, I believe, right? It was a draw. Uh when oh, he fought he won, did he win that fight. fight. Can you click on Mike Hamill? Was it a draw? No, I thought he won that fight. The last his last one, he was on a little bit of. Or did a win he get streak. the win? Oh, he did get the win. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. against uh, Nikayev. Nikayev. Yeah. He did win that fight. We had him on. and We talked about it. That's right. Yeah. Um, but I, well, I thought, for some reason, I thought it was a draw. But he, I'd seen him go through hell in that fight, and then in this fight, he, I had him win in the first two rounds, and he just took his foot off the gas pedal so much that he allowed Tim Wilde to get back in the fight and just start touching him, touching him. And then things got more difficult to get in on the takedowns, got more difficult to get into the clinch, all of those things. And then Tim was able to land the big shots and boom, fight was done. Yeah, I'm thinking to myself, man, like, this is why you don't take your foot off the gas. This is why you don't just cruise in that last round. I, that's what I saw. I, I don't know if that's what happened with him mentally, I don't know if that's what happened. If he got hurt or something, he just wasn't able to push the pace anymore. I don't know what happened, but I know that he just started staying on the outside and you, you being the smaller fighter in terms of height in comparison to Tim Wilde, what are you doing? Yeah. You should have fought, fought him in the phone booth because on the outside, he got hit with the head kick, got rocked, and then he circled, stayed away. Then he got hit with the straight long right. Boom, done. It, yeah. it just, where you were having success all the way out or all the way in, not in that middle range of where this guy can touch you. And um, he's going to go back and watch this fight, and he's going to fucking flip his lid. He's going to get super frustrated with himself. He's going to be because, frustrated with some yeah, of Yeah, it. it's yeah. one of those fights. But. All right, well, that's going to wrap up our Bellator talk. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And uh, Dave, you got any news for us, bud? Yeah, let's do a couple of uh, quick ones right here. Mm-hmm. First one is Aljo hitting a... Uh, 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 Interest in a Max Holloway fight. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Oh. It would obviously be at featherweight since he's talking about going up. Well, that's so funny because yesterday I was talking about that people want to see Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje. So which one is it? <laughs> like, are you staying at 45 and fighting Aljo or are you going up to uh, to fight Justin Gaethje? And I wanted to ask your opinion because I did this on the live show last night. Someone asked me about uh, Max Holloway su- suggesting or saying that he would go up and fight for the BMF belt against uh justin gaethje i personally do not like that fight for max holloway my thought my thought process on that is if he if he wants to take the time to put the weight on properly spend some time training properly with that weight on 
do a weight cut or two to get himself down and then also spar the next day, five rounds in that championship level because that's normally where he is. And if he starts filling himself out and realizing this is where I want to be, then I'm all for it. But as for him just to jump up like he did against Dustin Poirier, I don't think, I don't like that idea. Now, if Aljo wants to come up and test himself against Max Holloway, have at it, my man. More power to him. How about it? Not sure. You know? Not sure that's a fight you're gonna want to have. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't think so. That's a that's a tall you know that's a, that's a tall drink right there. Nothing against Aljo, but yeah, Aljo has his strength and stuff. But if there's one area that you're gonna look at that Aljo's weaker in, it would be his stand up. And if there's one area that Max Holloway has proven time and time again, his stand up is good, and now his mm-hmm. wrestling is just over time. You know, a lot of people have tried to take Max Holloway down now. It, earlier in his career, yeah, they got him down. The Dustin Poirier's, you know, and even Conor McGregor got him down. But that's not happening anymore. Mm-mm. You know, and you even saw Volkanovsky trying, you know, to get him to the ground and stuff at times. And it was like, it was tougher as, you know, as every time he tried, it was a tougher one to get. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I look at that. I would rather see Aljo face uh, Max at 145 mm-hmm. than I would see Max go up to 155 <sighs> and take on Gaethje. But, you know, let's be honest. Max, when he, you know, is fighting at 145 pounds the night of the fight, he's been as heavy as 170-some pounds. So, you know, yeah. 175 pounds. So he he does fill out. Yeah, well, I guess we'll find out. I mean, I like I said, I would. I'm down to see this fight. Um, but if you think that Sean O'Malley is a great striker, but you know, the, the one thing, <laughs> I and I want to say this, you know, this is something that most people don't really understand a lot. You know that it happens, but I love the fact that Al Jermaine is he's putting it out there. Hey, you know, trying to make it blessed. Great, you know, call yeah. out those fights that you want. That's how yeah. they happen. That's, you know, yeah. many times fighters are the ones that end up actually making the fight. Yeah. The matchmaker says, okay, boom. And then he puts yeah. out the contracts so and we got to fight, but yeah, you call your shot. I, lo- I love the fact that Aljo is calling that. And that's, that's, you know, obviously he's not trying to, uh, to skirt like, oh, I'm going to have an easy fight here. Yeah. He's going after someone that is a monster. No, I agree. I think that, um, I wish I would have done that more in my career. I looked at it too by calling people out. It was almost like trash talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a little weird to me. I don't know. I just, I never did it, but I understand it now. As you see the, like you said, closed mouths don't get fed. You know, if you want That's the it. fight, you got to speak up because it's no disrespect. You got to say it's no disrespect. And if you no, want that not, fight, does not, it motivate you? The whole, the whole reason I want to fight you is I respect you. Yeah. The whole reason I'm calling you out is because I respect your freaking abilities. Yeah, and I think abilities. that together we're going to put on a hell of a fight. And I want to mm-hmm. see if my skill set can beat your skill set. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. All right. What else you got for us, Dave? All right. Let's wrap up in a kind of funny one here. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, I'm trying to find. Is this the right one? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Cheers, Sonning gets a tattoo. Uh, of Anderson Silva after yeah, they had supposedly made a deal yeah. where uh, Anderson, like uh, they would watch a documentary and together the documentary on Anderson Silva and if Chael cried, he had to get the tattoo. Okay. That's a story that I read. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great and funny story and cute and stuff. Trust me, he didn't get a tattoo. No. <laughs> His frigging wife would kill him. Yep. Yep. Just destroy him. She yeah. would kill him, so. Hilarious. Uh, his... <laughs> Chael is in a different world. Oh, look. If Chael, Chael is all about having fun. And, and you know, the shtick goes yeah. a long ways. And this was something put together with, you know, Anderson. That's great. But trust me, Chael's not going over watching a movie and crying and losing a bet <laughs> to get a damn uh, <laughs> tattoo. That's just not going to happen. But uh, I, I love the whole you know gimmick it's yeah. great he's funny right. all right what did else you, you see, got for did him? you did you see that chael has decided to get into a battle with a guy named eric madrigan who is from canada a lawyer who is you know he'll talk and you know talk about the ufc and you know contracts mm-hmm. and things like that and chael has got into this battle it's like chael you're, you're not gonna win that battle stop 
up, but it's like, well, if you want to continue on, Eric is a lawyer. He, he probably in the end he's gonna beat you mm. up, beat you up a little bit, but you're a tough guy. It's okay. I haven't I'm seen gonna... it. I haven't seen it. This oh, is hilarious, this little tattoo yeah. stuff. <laughs> you should... Okay. So he didn't get tattooed, John. You know for sure. <sighs> I can't trust me, he didn't uh... get a tattoo. That's a henna. <laughs> these, these, uh, Hannah. Yeah. This is so funny. All right. Next, what else you got for us? That's, that's it. That's, that's all it? you got. That's it. That's all. Come on. Mm. Dave. We spent more yeah. time waiting for John's internet than we actually did the show. No shit. <laughs> no we're shit. Almost, I mean, we're almost an hour, we're an hour 45 by the time. Yeah. But an hour 50 by the time you, uh, wow. your part comes in. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hey, we want to wrap this up. Go to WayneInMerch.com. WayneInMerch.com. Pick up some of our apparel there. The weather is getting colder. Hoodies are available. Sweatshirts. Sweatshirts, baby. Sweatshirts. There we go. Hello. Very nice. Hoodies. And hoodies and hats and everything. I think we even got some beanies up there. So check it all out. Well, thank you guys so much for supporting us. OnlyFans.com slash WayneIn. OnlyFans.com slash WayneIn. Subscribe to us over there. It is free. John, take us away, bud. Hey, for everyone out there, I hope you enjoyed the UFC. I hope you enjoyed Bellator, and it was probably the last Bellator you're going to see with me and Josh in. But that's okay, <laughs> because you know what? You got to have fun in life, and we're going to go do other things. So for everyone out there, we will see you.